Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, Governors for Schools webinar. Um, we're focusing today on, on teaching, learning and assessment and what governors and trustees need to know about them. I'm Steve Barker and I'm joined today by my colleague Linda Waghorn. Hello. And we're here representing uh, Better Governor, which is an online learning platform for uh, governors and trustees and all those involved in governance in maintained schools and academies. And we work closely in partnership with Governors for Schools. And uh, both Linda and I are governors and chairs in uh, schools ourselves. And both of us have a considerable amount of experience of school governance over a number of years. So hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions that uh, you may want to uh, pose in today's webinar. The aims of the session today are to uh, hopefully ensure that by the end of the session, everybody is very aware of how this particular judgment, and I hope you know that uh, uh, the quality of teaching, learning and assessment is a judgment within the current Ofsted framework, but how this judgment really underpins everything that Ofsted is all about. And of course, we can't lose sight of the fact that the word Ofsted itself is an acronym. It's an acronym for the Office for Standards in Education. And uh, standards um, are represented and embodied by teaching, learning and assessment and the part that they play in them, of course, is absolutely uh, vital to the performance of all schools. We're also going to have a look at the role that evidence plays in Ofsted inspections and how that informs the judgments Ofsted make and what we can learn from that as governors and trustees to inform our own knowledge of our schools. It's also about us uh, making sure that they, the knowledge of that evidence that we've got does feature very, very much as part of the self-evaluation um, process that happens in our schools. It's not for us as governors to actually make judgments ourselves, of course, those are made by the professionals, but it is for us to actually understand the evidence that backs up those judgments and also to know that those judgments are the right judgments for our context based on the evidence base that exists. And we'll also be, as we go through the session, Session, but also towards the end of the session, focusing on some questions that governors particularly ought to ask in respect of this particular um, aspect of the Austin framework. Okay, following on from the introduction to Ofsted as one of the key focus for this area, this session, quality of teaching, learning and assessment, it is one of these four judgments that Ofsted make when they do a, undertake a formal inspection of a school and there is a strong focus on teacher knowledge. The application and the use of assessment, so using assessment wisely to inform uh, teachers of the ways in which they need to structure the next stage of learning for the pupils in their group. So the feedback from those processes and the way in which the knowledge that the teacher imparts and the skills that are developed in their pupils is informed by that continuous cycle. And for me, I think that's a good point to actually just pause on for a moment there, Linda. In my experience, a lot of us as governors tend to think about assessment first and foremost as a process that provides us with data. Um, that's, if you like, a side benefit of it, in my view. Yes, of course, assessment actually does uh, revolve around data, and that data has a variety of other uses. But as Linda said, what we're talking about here is prime use. The prime use of assessment is to inform teaching. And as governors, we need to actually um, recognise that. The assessment systems that we have in our schools sh should be telling teachers what children are learning today, what they learned yesterday, but most importantly, what they need to learn tomorrow. And for those of you that have been governors for a little while, you will know that we had a new national curriculum and this assessment system was very much part of the introduction of that new uh, national curriculum. So being able to measure and help teachers to uh, use their professional judgment as teachers about how to teach the next stage of learning to their particular pupils. So if we think about what's actually involved in the uh, structure of that judgment, this next slide really just outlines what, and again, this is another Ofsted document, this is taken from the Common Inspection Framework, which applies to all settings from early years right the way up to post 16, that Ofsted have a responsibility for inspecting. And these eight bullet points actually represent, I'm going to paraphrase them a little bit just to get them onto the slide, but these actually um, represent 
what that judgment is actually all about. And Linda and I are just going to go through uh, through these and uh, just give you a, a little bit of background to those. Um, the first one involves a spelling mistake, so profuse apologies for that. It should say expectation. I'm not sure ex expectorations is even a word, but that seems to have got through spell check for some reason. So uh, apologies for that, but high expectations for all learners. So right the way through from early years, right up to post 16, does the quality of the teaching, the learning experience and the use of assessment in our classrooms demonstrate that teachers, that schools have got sufficiently high expectations of what children and young people can achieve in schools. And that's a, that's a key aspect of it. And many of you, as Linda said, who've been governors for some time, will recognize that the last two frameworks now have talked about the, um, the culture of expectation, the culture of ambition that often expect to see in evidence in our schools. And a lot of that will be, re will be reflected, hopefully, in the observation of teaching and learning in schools, where Ofsted certainly, but head teachers and senior leadership teams on a day-to-day -day basis would want to see that reflected. And I think for me, I would just be thinking as, uh, in terms of my own experience as a chair in a, in a school, this is all learners, so there will be some children who will not be learning as effectively as others. So what are high expectations for those children? And there will be some children at the other end of that bell curve for whom learning is a little easier and a little faster. Are we having high expectations in terms of the stretch that we are offering those students as well? And I think that links nicely into that next bullet about subject knowledge. So we have, um, particularly at primary, a, a more, more common national curriculum frameworks, variations uh, more evident in secondary. Um, what does that look like in your school? We're required to put on the website some information about our curriculum uh, that will be based on subject knowledge, which is largely gleaned probably from the national curriculum box of knowledge and skills. But how is that supplemented? in our school what other things happen that are part of that wider planned learning for pupils so how after school clubs how uh, the pupil premium additional um, money is spent to support particular children to meet that first uh, high expectation and that awareness of all of those different groups of pupils those individual pupils in all of our schools irrespective of their age is really what that third bullet points about so Teachers are expected, all staff involved in teaching, so that would be classroom-based um, uh, TAs, etc. as well. Yeah. Are they aware of where children and young people are in their learning? What, what's their level of understanding? What do they know about what's being taught? And what can they do in terms of the tasks that are actually uh, um, being presented to them? And of course, that's really the start of the assessment process, because all adults in the classroom should be part of the ongoing assessment assessment that does inform teachers exactly where all learners are in that particular um, process at that point in time so that follow-up learning tomorrow and the day after and the next week etc can actually build on that and hopefully all contribute towards the progress we expect of all children. And so marking fits into this as well, uh, how pupils work is marked, how feedback, verbal feedback, written feedback is provided to pupils so they know how to improve their work, what to do next which areas to work harder on. The assessment process will pick up students who may grasp things fairly easily but struggle with a particular aspect of maths like fractions uh, and knowing how to give that extra support from collecting information about what children are understanding and can do with it. It's that cycle uh, and it should be consistent across the whole school. So all teachers, all TAs, all should be involved in this process of teaching and learning. So checking that learning is taking place, using assessment to ensure that learning is, is happening for all at appropriate levels. And parental engagement is the next bullet point on this list. And of course, it's important to recognize that with parental engagement the reason we want parents and carers to be involved in their children's learning is because there's very strong evidence to suggest that those children that do have the benefit of parental or carer engagement actually thrive better in our schools their levels of success are statistically far more significant than those that don't have the advantage of uh, parental engagement so if we're thinking about teaching and learning how does homework 
how does uh, you know research outside of school actually supplement that? Are parents made aware of what the curriculum is this week, what children are actually studying, how they can actually support that in the, and that back in the home environment, and how they you know how they are actually ensuring that their children are ready for school in terms of uh, attendance, punctuality, etc. comes into that as well, and how that's promoted through the classroom. I would also add to that information evenings for parents, often at secondary school, those first few terms when children uh, start secondary school, there are opportunities for parents to see how things are different by going in and having that type of experience and understanding how that works. Uh, and there will be also opportunities for uh, parents to come in and, uh, and do volunteering. Lots of primary schools offer assisted reading or times for parents to come in and just read with their children for enjoyment. So there are lots of ways in which parents feel they're part of their children's learning. And even at secondary school, I mean, just the very app that uh, a lot of secondary schools now have planners or homework diaries or whatever they might be called. And just parents aren't necessarily vetting their children's homework, but actually they are signing to say that it's been completed. And if we look then at equality and diversity, there are for some parents uh, English is a second language, they may be new in the country, new in the area, and understanding uh, additional needs of uh, both pupils and their families are important aspects of ensuring that we treat people fairly, but we respect the diversity of, of our group and we respond uh, appropriately to engaging them uh, across all of those areas, both the learning for the pupils themselves, but also in ways in which we engage with parents to make them feel part of that um, in, a, in a wider variety of ways than just putting something in the book bag and sending it home. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right there, Linda, that this, is, this isn't just about the protected characteristics, which is what a lot of us tend to think about when we talk about equality and diversity. You know, this is about really having a look at your own context and making sure, again, comes back to this idea of uh, knowing who the children and young people are that you're teaching and making sure that their needs are met, as you say, right the way across the board. And of course, meeting those needs really ties in neatly to that last bullet point. And this concept of readiness is something that's crept into the lexicon in uh, schools and in education generally in recent years. First of all, we had the idea of, uh, you know, are children school ready, which is, you know, really about making a judgment about the effectiveness of preschool provision. We now have, um, um, you know, the phrases, are they key stage two ready? Are they secondary ready? And of course, at the end of secondary now, are they life ready? You know, whatever life beyond secondary school, beyond post 16, beyond post 18 may mean, it might be in further education, higher education, it may be employment or training. But whatever that route is, are we ensuring in our settings, whether we're in primary or secondary, that we are engaged in that process of making the children and young people in our care ready for the next stage of their lives, whatever that might be. And if you happen to be a governor who is in a school with a unit or in a special school, this will need further unpicking because your pupils will all be very much more individual and readiness for their next stage may look very different in those contexts. And that of course will be linked back into that third bullet point of uh, awareness of what learners understand, know and can do, won't it? Great, okay, let's uh, let's move along. So as far as we're concerned as governors, I mean, one of the uh, key questions that we have to be able to, uh, to answer is, well, how do we know? How do we know what that judgment is? Um, the judgment of uh, quality of teaching, um, learning and uh, assessment. And one of the ways in which we, um, I think, get to that position is actually by recognition of, you know, the role that self-evaluation and self-review plays in our schools. Recognising that hopefully most of what we do as governors, attending meetings, reading various reports, scrutinising data, that constantly updates our balanced view of how good we are, what needs, still needs further improvement, etc. And the vast amount of information and data that flows to us as governors has never been as great as it is now. But knowing what to do with that information, where it supports other pieces of evidence that we may already have considered, or how it supports information that the head teacher is sharing with us. And importantly, that, that third bullet point, uh, it is not acceptable as, a, a, as an effect effective tool of governance to respond by saying I know it is so because the head teacher told me 
uh, it needs to be triangulated with that evidence base uh, in order to have any weight and it needs to be further unpicked by governors to test your understanding that what uh, you are being told is evidenced in some way with other pieces of documentation. And I think part of the way in which as governors we ensure that that evidence is actually being accumulated is actually accessible and being presented to us is by thinking about what structures we have within our own settings, be it in a, an academy trust, a multi-academy trust, or even maintained school, how do we structure governance to ensure that that flow of information that Linda's just been talking about is appropriate, it does meet on our needs as governors in terms of actually equipping us with an appropriate level of knowledge and understanding of our schools. And increasingly now we find uh, many governing bodies that have looked at being structured in a different way, maybe not having a committee structure as they did in the past, moved to a flat structure, looking at uh, a different way of working as a team. Um, one example of that that came up in, in my school was that we uh, have a flat structure with lead roles for governors. So we're thinking about teaching and learning. One of our priorities last year was an improvement in maths. Uh, and as well as the information that we were provided uh, with by the head teacher around the external support and training that was available for maths, uh, we also were invited to undertake a learning walk as governors with the teacher to see to, with the head teacher to see how uh, that had changed what was happening in the classroom, both in terms of the resources that were being used and the way in which different groups of learners were being grouped together and scaffolded in their learning rather than uh, helped with uh, prompts for answers, but actually really um, supported by our observation of what was happening against what the head teacher told us was happening. So we, we looked at that, we could see from the reports and the evidence that what we had been told was verified in our learning walk around to the classrooms. And I think there's some key words in, in, in those statements there, Linda, and I think probably one of the key ones for me, or the most important ones, is that idea that whatever we're doing in school or outside of school when we're actually perhaps uh, reading documentation, we are not making judgments. We're actually informing ourselves. This is very much about our edification as governors. And I think a really important distinction is that it's about our understanding. It's not about us going into judges. It's not about us being responsible for making those judgments. And there's a fine line to be trodden here because so of course, one of our roles as governors, as governors rather, is actually that ability to be able to understand that the judgments that are being shared with us are the correct ones. And again, that comes back to evidence. It's about saying, have we got the right evidence? Are we looking at the right things? And do we recognise that the judgments that are being shared with us are appropriate given the strengths or otherwise of the evidence that we've got? I'm somebody who thinks in pictures, so uh, we've talked a little bit about data uh, and information, very concrete. Um, I want you to think for a moment about a, a way in which our strategic overview of this particular area of school life is can be um, thought of as uh, taking a helicopter approach. So going up above and looking across a wider view than one class or one data set we're looking across the whole organisation uh, and we are looking at areas from, from a, a, a higher view that we can then say, well, why is that bit doing rather better than this? Uh, have we got some evidence to show us what we are doing about areas that aren't doing as well or appear to be more challenging than others? Because some of the context, some of the further background may be cohort specific, may be um, have roots in other aspects that we need to, to consider um, from a more strategic viewpoint. So looking from a distance allows us to have a more strategic view uh, and allows us to ask questions uh, to and, and, and challenge whether there are differences for a reason or whether there are differences that need to be addressed. And really that, and that underpins for me that, that basic role of government which is all about the ability to be able to compare and contrast and use that as a basis to inform our questioning. And I think just going back to this whole aspect of teaching, learning and assessment, it's very easy 
be um, as governors to be lured into getting way too operationally involved. So if you go and visit one classroom, your view can be a little bit jaundiced, shall we say, from that singular view. Whereas as Linda says, if you're actually taking a step back and saying, well, how does that compare to what I know elsewhere? How does that compare to what I've seen in reports and data from the rest of the school? That then makes us think about, well, what are those, those big ticket items? What are those strategic questions that we ought to be asking to actually inform our overview of the whole school? And the next slide actually um, really builds on that. And Linda mentioned the word triangle triangulation a few moments ago. Uh, an apology on uh, this slide, unfortunately, uh, the PowerPoint was actually done in PowerPoint, of course, in a, um, a Windows environment, and we're actually using a, an Apple machine to uh, share this with you today. And um, Unfortunately, Apple doesn't like some of the graphics on uh, PowerPoint. So uh, my very clever um, four concentric uh, triangles all uh, supporting each other um, has actually yet been morphed into a pyramid here so apologies I'll talk you through it rather than actually point to the uh, point to the different shapes but if you can imagine that the, in the center of this uh, this shape that should be on the slide is the judgment and the idea of tri triangulation of judgment is that the, the triangle I'm reliably informed by people who are far more competent in maths than I am is um, the strongest shape in geometry and therefore the assumption is that if you can triangulate evidence you can come at it from three different uh, uh, points of verification it means you've got a very strong a very robust and probably we hope some fairly rigorous evidence that uh, backs that up and if we're thinking about teaching and um, learning and assessment then of course one of the key the key areas that we're going to be looking at is the one that's showing at the bottom of this pyramid here but is one of my uh, my three triangle points and that's looking at pupil outcomes and when i say outcomes i don't just mean the outcomes of sats tests at the end of key stage one and two or the end of public examinations at key stages four and five we're talking about outcomes based on assessment, on teacher assessments for all year groups. So right from early years through year one into year two, three and four and five in primary, and then seven, eight, nine and 10 in secondary. What are the outcomes for all of those years? So do we know what pupil progress is? Do we know that children and young people are making progress in their learning every day of every week of every year in school? So if we think of judgment as the professional judgments that are made in school about the quality of teaching, and the quality of learning, usually judged from the work that children do. Then the outcomes data, the pupil progress data, is the first bit of evidence that we use as governors to, uh, to compare with what the school is saying about teaching and learning. So if we are being uh, told by, uh, in head teachers report, reports, that teaching and learning is, is outstanding, then our pupil progress data that we're receiving should triangulate with that information and support the school's internal judgment. And then, of course, if we move on to uh, what ought to be my next uh, triangle, but in fact, it's the next rung up the, uh, uh, the pyramid, we've got appraisal and lesson observation there. And whether it's called appraisal, or whether it's called performance management in your school or trust, it doesn't actually matter if the process is the same. But it's about us as governors not being involved in that process in terms of a direct involvement, but actually having an appreciation of the depth and the rigor that is actually applied to that process. So hopefully what we would actually see in that when we're talking to our head teachers, and of course this is quite a good time of year to be reflecting on this, many of us will have had uh, pay committees, salaries and appraisal committees, whatever we want to call them uh, very recently, following the end of the last cycle of uh, performance management at the end of October. And one of the things that I would certainly expect as a governor head teachers to be feeding back in that uh, um, kind of setting would be, well, how are judgments in terms of appraisal and performance management made? What does get taken account of? Does it go back to um, those bullet points that we had on that slide that came out of the common inspection framework? Where, where does teacher knowledge fit into this? Where does that knowledge of the curriculum fit in? Are they judging the pace of lessons? Um, we talked about everybody in the classroom. Ofsted certainly make judgments about how effectively teaching assistants or learning assistants are deployed. Um, are head teachers actually judging that element of, uh, of teaching and learning when they're going into classrooms? And again, the idea of meeting the needs of all learners and perhaps a few other things that uh, we may not have talked about so far. The learning environment. You know, does the classroom actually look like a place where children and young people are inspired to learn. What are the displays like? How is technology used? Um, you know, 
what resources are available for children and young people to actually use in their learning. And then that final triangle is external um, triangulation. So whether we have information from outside the school that is supporting what we are being told in terms of the judgment and the other the parts that we've already discussed are our board responsibilities. So are we working with partners? Do we have uh, external moderation by the board, uh, the, the MAT board? Are we working with our local authority school improvement partner or, or advisor? And not all schools will have access to those these days, but in those cases where they, they do, um, that will be an important function. That is an external function, function and often results in some kind of reporting uh, to the board. Uh, if we've been offsteaded in the last 12 to 24 months, the statements that are made in that Ofsted report may well be um, part of the focus of teaching and learning that we need to uh, take into account both in terms of verification, but also in terms of our strategic priorities and making sure that we are asking questions and holding the school to account for improvement in those areas. It is that time of year where we are receiving our first lots of national data about outcomes uh, information from the examinations that were taken earlier on in the summer. Um, what are the comparisons within our own group of schools, within our own area and to national data and are we uh, comparing and benchmarking favourably? Uh, some schools are part of uh, an LA moderation process that would include academies uh, and that information is important uh, to understand and to know as a board. So sometimes these things will happen in isolation of the board and it is worth asking uh, your head teacher whether they have been part of a either a moderation that is undertaken by the local authority or, or cross school moderation and how that has informed and supported judgments made about teaching and learning. And just coming back to this idea of how we're structured and how that can actually help us um, make sure that we do have the right information, how that that's actually kept up to speed. Um, sorry, this slide does look like a little bit of an eye test, but I've got a, a, a close up of two of the columns on the next slide, which hopefully will make it a little uh, simpler. Linda mentioned earlier on in the session, uh, um, some governing bodies now favour a flat structure with no committees at all. Uh, one of the schools where I'm chair, we have such a, a, a structure and the school isn't called St Elsewhere, so I've just uh, called it that on the slide here for uh, the sake of anonymity. Um, but you can see hopefully on this, um, what we call a work programme, this is just a map of what the governing body is planning to do throughout the year in those six scheduled meetings and you say we just simply call them autumn one autumn two spring one and two and so on and so forth and the top of this chart for each slide shows you what the strategic areas are and these are the areas that are actually going to end up driving the agenda for those governing body meetings yellow band in the middle is the head teacher report information only um, underneath that really is a flag for us as governors great way of improving governing body efficiency is to not talk about the things that you don't need to talk about in my view so information only you can see on this particular one attendance data and um, professional development update and, and uh, impact well actually attendance data if attendance is not an issue in your school tell somebody in the supporting documentation what the percentage is hopefully the target as well and where you are in the national in terms of the national averages if you're well above and you're on target there is no discussion needed move on and uh, focus discussion on the things that really do matter strategically and similarly CPD update governors ought to be able to recognize that staff professional development should be linked to the school development plan there's no need to talk about it unless there are any exceptional questions that people need to ask and with the if you've got good clerking taking place in your school you will have agreed this uh, term some school priorities uh, and that will form part of the deeper action planning that the school has done to achieve that and a good clerk will also include in this planner uh, the monitoring uh, duties that have been assigned to the governing body where there needs to be visits where there needs to be additional uh, data coming back to the board either in terms of head teachers report or to inform some of those uh, priorities uh, that are shown 
open uh, in the regular agenda items. So if we move forward, and all I've done on the next slide is really just isolate and, uh, and enlarge a little bit those two strategic boxes for the um, first um, two meetings of the academic year, autumn one and autumn two, as we're calling them. And you can see here that apart from anything else, I mean, this is the idea of the flat structure, just in case some of you are not familiar with it, is that all governors get to know all of the important key performance indicators of the school because everybody's involved in every meeting. Um, so you don't have governors saying, oh, don't talk to me about pupil data, I sit on the finance committee, or don't talk to me about finance, I sit on children learning, or whatever that committee may be. Everybody here is exposed to all of the information that's shared at all meetings. And so, of course, what we're talking about specifically with regard to teaching, learning and assessment is pupil performance. The performance of different groups of pupils is relevant, as is the um, appraisal outcome for those reasons that we've already highlighted. And you can see that in autumn term one, that red frame I've just put on the, uh, the table there, we're looking at the annual pupil premium report, we're looking at the annual um, impact assessment of the sports grant. Um, both of those are looking at the impact that specific initiatives, or specific funding initiatives have on pupil progress. And I think an important thing to think about now with our pupil premium, um, particularly for maintained schools where it's now a statutory requirement, I would say it's actually very good practice in academies anyway, so I would expect them to do it too and that is to actually publish the pupil premium strategy as it's called on the school website now, there's a very good pupil premium strategy template on the teaching schools network website and one of the things that that does is actually talk about um, or talk about it actually encourages schools to identify and therefore it's something for us to talk about as governors those barriers to learning that might exist specifically for those pupil premium generating pupils and of course, once we've identified what the barriers are, that then um, hopefully generates a whole host of other questions for us as governors as well. How do we go to actually overcoming those barriers? So if we've got approval of the school development plan happening in autumn term one, and there are some specifics, uh, if I go back to the example I gave earlier around maths, then we would be further talking about pupil premium in terms of supporting those pupils um, in their maths targets that fall into those particular groups. And we would be looking at some appraisal objectives, anonymized objectives of staff that allow us to understand how their objectives are going to feed into the achievement of our school priorities. And then if we move on to autumn term two, you can see then, and again, a lot of you will either have perhaps done this in the last couple of weeks or be thinking about this uh, coming up at a meeting. Uh, for a lot of primary schools, their data was actually published this week. It was published on Monday this week. Um, when I say their data, their public um, facing data. So the uh, analyzing school performance, which is the ASP report and then the IDSR, the inspection data summary report. Uh, those are available now. Um, early years foundation um, stage data isn't available in my authority at the moment. Um, I'm based in Surrey. Uh, it, it may be in others, but that's yet to come. But most governing bodies will be focusing on that. And of course, that data is a very good opportunity to say, how does this tally with what we're being told in school, what we're seeing in terms of uh, assessment data from other year groups? Because of course, we should always recognize that depending on the type of school we're in, the public data that's coming out through ASP and from IDSR and possibly even from things like Fisher Family Trust and any other um, uh, proprietary brands that are out there for collecting data, that's just giving us a snapshot view of one year group usually or possibly two if you're in a through primary school. But what do we know about the other um, year groups in our school and how does that compare and contrast? So we're looking at improving the way in which we hold the school to account and this is an improvement by the whole governing body as a corporate function rather than just one or two key individuals we are aiming to understand what factors inform the self-evaluation judgments that first of all the school makes on itself uh, and then um, how we triangulate that with other information that we receive so the the school may be making judgments about the quality of teaching and learning as observed by them formally. And we will be using as governors and trustees the assessment data uh, to triangulate that. But what other questions might we want to ask about how uh, those 
judgments have been informed and how consistent assessment is both in, in terms of collection use and uh, practice across the whole school uh, and what the impact of that is on, on uh, children's learning. In terms of teaching, we might want to try and triangulate information about uh, CPD. So we are setting objectives for staff, but what CPD offer is uh, helping them to be successful in being able to deliver those objectives uh, for, for pupils. Uh, and importantly, where is that external triangulation coming from? There is a danger in the smaller mats that they uh, fall outside of regular external um, overview unless they seek to buy that in so that they've got that impartial view that looks at their data at that helicopter view and can then professionally support judgments that governors and trustees are trying to make. And I think a, a, an important consideration there as well is for those of you who may be trustees in multi-academy trusts, think about asking the question, do we actually look outside, even if the trust has got a strong um, internal structure, do we look outside of the trust at other local schools who aren't perhaps part of our multi-academy trust, do we look at that, what they're doing? Because you know, there isn't a monopoly on best practice just sitting in multi-academy trust. Yes, they're very good at sharing their own practice for the most part, but do they look at other practices? elsewhere because that again could help teaching learning and assessment in our own schools. I think particularly that is relevant when we're looking at what the barriers to learning are. Um, it, it may be that we have gained over a period of time a very strong, deep and in, well informed understanding of our community, our learners, uh, the groups of pupils that we have but they don't always remain static. So we may be facing new areas, uh, new barriers to learning, uh, and other schools uh, within and outside of our, uh, our own experience may have developed uh, practice and um, processes which help support their learners in a more effective way. So we should be outward looking, that's, a, that's an intention, uh, of the, the DfE's uh, understanding of education and, and academies uh, and schools in a collaborative fashion. No school should be inward facing and only looking to itself. Uh, so once we've understood all we can about our own school, that comparison to others uh, can support us being able to ensure that we are doing uh, the best we can to, to overcome those barriers for every pupil. And then I think the last two bullet points, one could actually uh, look at the questions there probably as, as part of the same issue, although they're slightly different. Current performance tallying with the judgment, that by, by judgment what we mean there is the judgment that currently sits in your self-evaluation document. So if you're seeing some um, information, some data that perhaps suggests that things have taken a little bit of a, um, a dip uh, as far as pupil performance is concerned, how does that impact on the quality of um, teaching judgment, the quality of learning judgment? Is it still appropriate to say that uh, uh, things are as well as they used to be and we're still at an outstanding school if you've actually dipped below the national standard this year? It may be, but it's certainly a question that governors should ask. And of course, education generally is a fairly dynamic process, as we all know. Every year we have different children. Every year, lots of schools have different staff as well. So has that judgment changed since September? Because very often September is when we get um, new members of staff joining the school. It's always when we get new pupils joining. What's changed since then? What are those dynamics? And as governors, are we aware of those? And are we asking the right questions to deepen our knowledge and our understanding of the context that we're operating in? And some schools have um, expanded. They may have changed their category. They may be growing from an infant or junior school into a, a, a primary school or they may have taken on a nursery, or they may have responsibilities for a, uh, a unit, and the children in a unit will be even more individual, and therefore uh, we need to consider their needs in a more individual way, which could have changed significantly since uh, our intake last year. And I think we also need to think about what is the information that we want in recognising that context of our school. So very often now we find ourselves talking about sort of KPIs, key performance indicators of schools, 
those will vary. Some of them will be common across all settings, but they will vary tremendously from school to school. And Linda's just talked about uh, schools that have special needs um, units or um, centres within them. There are lots of schools now that have uh, quite large proportions of children with EHCPs and uh, additional needs. That's part of the context and if it's part of the context we need to think about are we looking at the right things as governors, as trustees etc. Have we got our finger on the appropriate pulse points? And of course the bigger the multi-academy trust, if you are a governor or a trustee in a multi-academy trust setting, you then have to think at what level do you look at that uh, that detail, bearing in mind the, yeah, the helicopter view that we were extolling the virtues of earlier. Okay, well, at this point, it's um, you know, fair to say that hopefully those of you listening to uh, this recording will realise that uh, uh, we have actually conducted this uh, this webinar in a darkened room on our own with no participants. We got knocked off air um, earlier in the day today, so we've actually re-recorded this. Normally, we would ask people to come online and ask questions, submit them by the, uh, the dashboard, etc. Sadly, we haven't had the opportunity to do that very much in, in today's session, but if you have any questions, questions, please either field them directly to uh, the guys at Governors for School and they'll make sure that Linda and I actually get them and we will respond to them, I can assure you. Um, or failing that, if you want to actually contact us on the Better Governor platform, you're more than welcome to do that. If you haven't um, signed up for Better Governor yet, it's free to uh, uh, sign up to. It's also free to access the written articles on there as well. Um, our view um, is very much that governors do need information, they need the right information at the right time. And our strap line, as you can see on there, is what you need to know when you need to know. It. So, get in contact with us. Um, thank you very much for listening to this recording. I'm sorry we didn't get it right the first time, but technology defeated us today. We look forward to seeing you again in the not too distant future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.